Okay, welcome to another service at Grace Community Church. And uh, we're going to look at this morning something that we haven't looked at for a while. And it's, it's really going to be just kind of a <laughs> uh, here and there different uh, verses just to kind of whet your appetite about end times. And it's probably a good thing that we look at some end times. There's, I mean, if you watch TV, boy, it's all prophecy, 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 what's happening, prophecy is being fulfilled here and there and so forth. But what does the scriptures really say, you know, about the day in which we are living and uh, about the future? And, uh, you know, especially now with, with COVID and uh, the, the politics and so forth, uh, a lot of anxiety, a lot of fear, a lot of wondering what's going to happen. And uh, I really feel for those who do not know the Lord Jesus Christ as their Savior. Because uh, what hope is there? You know, they have nothing to look forward to. For we as members of the body of Christ, can we can look at God's Word and we can have hope. Because we know someday, regardless of what happens, we're going to be with Christ for all eternity. But yet we can, we can still look in the Scriptures and we know what's going to happen in the future. Uh... God does not give us a specific timetable as, as in reference to the time which we are living now when it's going to end. But if we look towards the future uh, after the age of grace which we are living in and uh, watch the world conditions, we can see that the world conditions are setting the stage for uh, the tribulation period and the kingdom which is immediately after the rapture of the church. And the rapture of the church is another thing which, uh, boy, I tell you, there's fewer pastors all the time that actually believe in the rapture. And there's still uh, fewer, fewer, uh, it, a small percentage of those that do believe in the rapture um, believe that it's at the end of this age before the tribulation period. Uh, I heard just the other day that Another one uh, thinks that the rapture is right before the second coming. We go up in the rapture and come right back down with Christ again. Well, I don't know where in Scripture you find that because it's not there. So in rightly dividing the word of truth is the key to understanding what is going on today and what is going to happen in the future. And uh, <clears throat> of course we need to look at the timeline once again very quickly with the biblical timeline. Um, <clears throat> these are the different what dispensations or ages in the, in the past innocence, conscience, human government, promise we see that the 2,000 years all the way from Adam up to Abraham and those 2,000 years are all covered in the first 11 chapters of Genesis so <clears throat> in regards to prophecy now you'll notice here that there's no place in there where there's the age of grace and there's a good reason for that is because all the Old Testament prophets and including the time that Jesus spoke on the earth, there is no reference, not single, not a one single reference all the way up until the, until the Acts do we have a reference regarding the age of grace, the body of Christ, or the age which we're living in today. It's not there, and which we'll look at in just a minute. So, but prophecy, most of all the prophetic scriptures were written during this time right here before Christ. And what were they written about? The prophecy? Right here. They knew the tribulation period was the next thing on the agenda. Uh, even Christ talked about it, which we just read in Matthew chapter 24. But <clears throat> they were looking forward to the tribulation period and, of course, the kingdom, a thousand-year reign. And all the gold... Testament prophets all point to the tribulation and the thousand year reign. And we'll look at a few of those maybe this morning. But we need to get that concept in our head that there's uh, <clears throat> uh, the mystery, which is the age of grace which we are living in, which God introduced shortly after the ascension of the Lord Jesus Christ, which was introduced basically by the Apostle Paul, uh, the Lord Jesus Christ revealing him, revealing a message to the Apostle Paul. And we find he was saved in Acts chapter 9. 
So we see now we are in this green right there. We're in the present. This is all the past here, the future is up here. We are right here. And we must remember those that all the uh, references, of course, the, uh, the books, Romans through Philemon, refer to the body of Christ, the age of grace, which we are in right now. At the end of the age of grace, of course, we have the rapture. And uh, you notice the rapture is also in green. Why? Because that is part of the revelation that was given to the Apostle Paul by the Lord Jesus Christ. So you cannot take this and put it in the middle here, or put it here, or put it over here, or put it any other place. It is part of the message of the age of grace which we are living in today. Extremely important. Um, <clears throat> so we're going to look at the future, but uh, notice that here we have prophecy, mystery, and prophecy. The Old Testament all the way from Genesis 12, well, really all the way up to the ascension of Christ or the Apostle Paul, it's all it's concerning prophecy. And you notice what it also concerns is Israel. All prophecy in the scripture is related to the nation of Israel. There's no prophecy concerning our age, which we are living in today. Now, sometimes when I say this, sometimes I'll make the comment that prophecy, biblical prophecy is not being fulfilled today. Now, that, <laughs> that sets a lot of people back. And if you uh, um, just stay with me, okay? <laughs> uh, and you'll see why or what, uh, how, why I say that. But anyway, uh, so we have the mystery which we're living in today and then, of course, the future is prophecy again. One thing you cannot do, and there's many pastors, especially Pastor Stam, and there's others, um, J.C. O'Hare said you cannot mix mystery with prophecy, or prophecy with mystery. Once you do that, you've got a mess. <laughs> uh, I think it's, Feldick says that's like putting no, Put, if you take part of this information from here or information from here and you mix them all together, it's like putting them in a blender and just mix it all up. What do you have? You got a mixture of everything. And uh, I like to think of it as uh, if you do that, many people that do that and many preachers even that do that and mix things up like that, it's like their minds are concrete. Thoroughly mixed up and firmly set. And boy, trying to change <laughs> Uh, you know, explain to them sometimes what the scripture really says, uh, it's kind of difficult. But anyway, let's go on. Speaking of the revelation of the mystery, the Apostle Paul says in Ephesians 3, verse 5, it says, which in other ages was not made known. He's speaking about the revelation that was given to him, the Apostle Paul, by the Lord Jesus Christ. And we could spend this whole time just in, in talking about that about the revelation that was given to the Apostle Paul. Galatians chapter 1, he, did, he, he says he did not receive it of man, but he received it uh, directly by revelation from the Lord Jesus Christ. Um, another verse. Um, thought I had another one here. Oh, yeah, the, Romans 16, 25 and 26. It says, Now to him that is a power to establish you according to my gospel. Notice he says, my gospel. That's the Apostle Paul. Well, if it's his gospel, what is it? The preaching of Jesus Christ according to the revelation of the mystery, which was kept secret since the world began. So there's another verse that says that the revelation that was given to the Apostle Paul was secret, kept secret, uh, since the world began. It was in the mind of God. It was in the mind of God in eternity past. But it was never revealed until revealed to the Apostle Paul. It says, but now is made manifest. <clears throat> now, in talking about the rapture, uh, a common verse of scripture that people go to when they talk about the rapture, as far as the future is concerned, is Revelation chapter 4, verses 1 and 2. First, I'm going to tell you the book of Revelation is entirely Jewish. The body of Christ is not in the book of Revelation. The age of grace is not in the book of Revelation. The churches that are in first part of Revelation are strictly Jewish. 
You cannot find any, any information in those messages to those seven churches that deal with the body of Christ, the revelation of the mystery, which we are in today. It's entirely Jewish. And uh, <clears throat> so anyway, after the, those, three, those three chapters, beginning in chapter 4, Revelation, it says, remember John is writing, he says, And after this I looked, and behold, a door was opened in heaven, and the first voice which I heard was as it were of a trumpet, talking with me, which said, Come up hither, and I will show these things which must be hereafter. And immediately I was in the spirit, and behold, a throne was set in heaven, and one sat on the throne. Now this is the verse that is used for the rapture. Can you see why they would even use this verse at all for the rapture? The only, the only words is, come up hither. Well, who's the Lord talking to? John. He says, come up here. I will show thee. He's not talking about it. Not about believers out of the age of grace or any other believers other than John. And he said, I will show things which may be hereafter. And immediately I was in the spirit and behold, a throne was set in heaven and on him and one that sat on the throne. Is there any reference at all uh, with regard to the body of Christ, the age of grace that refers to a throne that was set in heaven and one that sat on the throne? No. The closest we can get is where the Apostle Paul and also Peter and, and uh, that wrote about that the, the Lord Jesus Christ is now seated at the right hand of the Father. And if you want to stretch that out, you can say it's throne and so forth. But that is, uh, come up hither, he's talking to John. He has nothing to do with the body of Christ. Another passage that I also hear, I've heard many times, is that there is no reference other than Paul's epistles concerning the rapture except John 14. They go to John 14. Well, let's look at that. John 14, 1 and 3, 2, 3, it says, Let not your heart be troubled. You believe in God. Believe also in me. Be, be, believe also in me. In my Father's house are many mansions. If it were not so, I would have told you. I go to prepare a place for you. And if I go and prepare a place for you, I will come again and receive you unto myself that where I am, there ye may be also. Now, for this reference to have any reference at all to the rapture, you'd have to click completely what you call spiritualize the thing. But it's completely taken out of context if you do that, because what is the context? It's the Lord Jesus Christ talking to the 12 apostles. He says, I will go and prepare a place for you. I will come again and receive you unto myself. Well, what's he referring to? If you go back to Matthew, chapter 19, verse 28, it says, And Jesus said unto them, Verily I say unto you, that ye which have followed me in the regeneration, when the Son of Man shall sit in the throne of his glory, ye also shall sit on twelve thrones, judging the twelve tribes of Israel. So what is the Lord Jesus telling the twelve apostles? Yes, I have prepared a place for you. There are many mansions that I have prepared a place for you, and you will be with me. Well, here it is right here. That ye which have followed me in the regeneration, when the Son of Man shall sit on the throne of his glory. The regeneration is the coming of the kingdom, the thousand-year reign. When the Son of Man, the Lord Jesus Christ, will sit in the throne of his glory, ye also shall sit on twelve thrones judging the 12 tribes of Israel. So that's what the 12 apostles will be doing during the thousand year reign. This whole context of, of uh, chapter 14 of John 14 is the Lord Jesus Christ talking to the 12 apostles about the thousand year reign. No reference whatsoever to um, <clears throat> the rapture or the age of grace. Now when we look at prophecy, we have to kind of establish some foundational truths looking at prophecy because when you look at the book of Revelation, which we normally uh, see as prophecy, I mean, which we uh, refer to the book and we talk about prophecy, you think about Revelation right away. 
There are other books, there are many other books in the Old Testament that are, pro that are prophetic. And when you study the book of Revelation, you need to study the book of Daniel right with it. Because Daniel and Revelation go hand in hand. And uh, there are some of the same visions and so forth. Even though they look different, it is still talking about the same thing. But in Daniel, we have 70 weeks of years that were prophesied that the Lord Jesus Christ told Daniel what would is in reference to the nation of Israel. 70 weeks of years. Well, weeks of years would be 490 years. So there's 490 years of prophecy that the Lord Jesus was telling Daniel what was going to take place in regards to the nation of Israel. Well, first we have to determine when does that 490 years start? Well, it started in 445 B.C. with... Uh, the, uh, the command to restore Jerusalem by Nebuchadnezzar, not Nebuchadnezzar, Artaxerxes. King Artaxerxes back in 445 B.C., which is recorded in Nehemiah chapter 2. You can look at that, and it is Nehemiah chapter 2 is where it tells that this is uh, the command to rebuild Jerusalem, restore Jerusalem. And according to Daniel, which we'll see in just a second here, that's when he says it is going to begin. So if you add 490 years to 445 B.C., take into consideration the years of 360 days with the Hebrew calendar, not the, uh, the one we go by now, and then uh, figure in leap years and so forth, you come to um, <clears throat> the cross um, where the Messiah will be cut off. Now I should actually go to Daniel here. So we can see it. Um, Daniel 24, it says, 70 weeks are determined upon thy people and upon thy holy city to finish the transgression, to make an end of sins, to make reconciliation for iniquity. This is all going to take place at the second coming of Christ. When Christ comes back to the earth, he will finish the transgression, he will make an end of sins, to make reconciliation for iniquity, to bring in everlasting righteousness, and to seal up the vision and prophecy, and to anoint the most holy. Know therefore and understand that from the going forth of the commandment to restore and build Jerusalem, there it is, unto the Messiah the Prince, which is as reference to the Lord Jesus Christ, shall be seven weeks, three score and two weeks. The street shall be built again, the wall even in troublous times. Okay, so from 445 B.C. up until the time the Messiah, the Lord Jesus Christ, would be cut off at the crucifixion, it is to be seven weeks and three score and two weeks. Well, let's see. Seven weeks, three score is how much? Sixty. And two would be sixty-two plus seven, sixty-nine weeks. Okay, so from the... The command 445 BC, which we saw um, here, from here to here, Messiah cut off 69 weeks. There's 62 weeks, there's 49 weeks, uh, or seven weeks. And so we have 69 weeks. So the Messiah is cut off, and that is the crucifixion. Now, if you want to go in real detail, on figuring that out right to the day with leap years and holidays and everything else you need to read um, Sir Robert Anderson's book on the seven Daniel 70 weeks and it's not even a thick book but you, there's lots of information I mean he goes into detail every single day and counts every day and what it, actually what it ends up to uh, I didn't put the dates on here there's a date on here but uh, the date here is April the 6th, uh, AD 32. So anyway, he's got it all figured out. But anyway, <clears throat> so that's 69 weeks. All right, so we've got 69 weeks of prophecy that have been fulfilled. And that, by the way, that's all history. That's way back. <laughs> that's already been fulfilled. But what about the last week? We got 70 weeks. There's one more week. Well, of course, what happened is we have the introduction of the Age of Grace. Now, I've got one year in here, Luke 13, and we could look at that, but that is the 
display of God's grace and mercy on the nation of Israel because at the crucifixion, they should have been judged right there by rejecting their Messiah, by crucifying him. However, through the parable of the uh, uh, fig tree that, um, uh, remember the caretaker, the husbandman said, uh, let it alone one more year because the caretaker was going to cut it down. And he said, no, let it, let, it, let it go one more year. And that's a little parable of concerning the nation of Israel. And God did that. He added one more year. And if you add that year from the time of the crucifixion until the Apostle Paul comes on the scene, well, actually, it's uh, the stoning of Stephen, which is the end of uh, God's dealing with Israel. There's one year that's been added in there. Now you can, you know, there's there's some uh, discussion concerning that. I'm not going to be dogmatic about that right now, but anyway, the age of grace is what interrupted the, the 70 weeks. 69 weeks have passed of history, but there's one week left. And that's, of course, what we have. Uh, let's go back to the other. Whoop. There's the one week right there. So we have uh, 49, we have, uh, let's see, what was it, seven weeks and 62 weeks, 69 weeks up to here, and here's the seventh one right here. Remember, one week is seven years. And that is still future. And that is a tribulation period, which must take place uh, in the future, immediately after the rapture. Now let's go back, uh, let's see. More in Daniel. It says, After three score and two weeks shall Messiah be cut off, but not for himself. The people of the prince shall come and shall destroy the city and the sanctuary. The end thereof shall be with the flood until the end of war. Desolations are determined. He shall confirm the covenant. Notice, he, this is the Antichrist, the, the prince that shall come, which is in reference to the Antichrist. When the Antichrist comes, which will be in that tribulation period, immediately after the rapture, the Antichrist is going to show up. And uh, it says, he shall confirm the covenant with many for one week. Well, he can, shall confirm what covenant? We hear a lot about when the Antichrist comes, he's going to make a covenant with the nation of Israel for seven years. Uh, he doesn't actually make one according to scripture, but he confirms the covenant. The covenant. He shall confirm the covenant with many for one week. The many, of course, is the nation of Israel. And in the midst of the week, he shall cause the sacrifice, the oblation to cease. For the overspreading of abominations, he shall make it desolate, even until the consummation that determined shall be poured upon the desolate. Now that's all about the, uh, mostly about the second half of the tribulation period. But just remember, he is confirming the covenant with the nation of Israel. Uh, you can take this for what it's worth, I'm just going to mention it, but how close do you think we are to the rapture and the tribulation period? I mean, conditions in the earth today seems that we are probably pretty close. We're right towards the end of the age of grace and the rapture could actually take place at any time. I mean, you see all the nations lining up over in the Middle East. Uh, I'm going to say against Israel, which they are, most of them are. However, what about the peace treaty that Trump was involved with? We see many of those nations over in the Middle East now are joining this treaty. I forget how many there are right now, but I think there was like five on the list, and they said there were more. There are four now, and there is, they said that there'd be more after that. Well, what does that tell you? Most of, these, most of these nations that are signing this treaty are signing the treaty, a peace treaty with the nation of Israel. Uh, that's interesting. And I always say this, could it be that this is the, uh, the peace treaty or the, uh, the confirming that the Antichrist will do when he comes. Now, I don't know. That's just speculation. <laughs> but could it be? I don't know. Anyway, let's go on. Uh, we're not going to get a lot of detail right there. But 
Remember back in Matthew 24, it said, But he shall endure to the end, the same shall be saved. Endure to the end. During the tribulation period, there's going to be a lots of tribulation. There's going to be a lot of things that are going to be happening uh, <clears throat> on the earth at this particular time. Uh, it says in Matthew 24, Jesus says, But he that shall endure unto the end, the same shall be saved. Now, this is not talking about personal salvation of the soul. This is talking about physical salvation. Because there's in the tribulation period, there's all kinds of things that are going to take place as far as uh, physical uh, harm. Uh, there's wars. There's uh, all kinds of things. And, and, of course, the spiritual world is going to be involved with this. No doubt about that. But at the time, if you don't take the mark of the beast, either on your forehead or your right hand, uh, then what happens? You're doomed. If you want to buy food or sell anything, buy or sell anything, you need that mark of the beast. How long are you going to exist if you do not have that mark when you can't buy or sell anything? Uh, that's going to happen in the tribulation period. It says, the gospel of this kingdom shall be preached in all the world for a witness unto all nations. What is going to be the gospel in the, during the tribulation period, in the future? The gospel of the kingdom. Not the gospel of the grace of God, but the gospel of the kingdom, which the Lord Jesus Christ preached, which the twelve apostles preached while they were on earth. It's the gospel of the kingdom. And what is the gospel of the kingdom? The good news concerning the kingdom that is about to come what they were looking forward to, what the Old Testament prophets wrote about, that thousand-year reign when the Lord Jesus Christ has set up as his kingdom on the earth. Um, we looked at this one already. In Revelation 12, it gives a, a little bit of a history because well, our time is going already and I'm just starting this. Anyway, in Revelation 12, in the uh, first 11, chap 11 verses, it gives kind of an overview of the nation of Israel and concerning um, Lucifer and Satan when he is cast out of heaven. Now, if we look in the Old Testament, Isaiah 14, Ezekiel 28, we see Lucifer. We see the uh, anointed cherub. The angel which God uh, gave uh, power over, he was the anointed cherub over all the other angels. And he was perfect in his ways until what? Until iniquity was found in him. Then he became Satan. And uh, <clears throat> when he is Satan, we, we, we hear a lot of times that he was cast out of heaven at that time. No, he was not cast out of heaven, but he lost his position as the anointed cherub. Satan has access to heaven today. He accuses us day and night. Revelation tells us that. But here in, in uh, Revelation chapter 12, we see him actually cast out of heaven down to the earth. Okay, there appeared a great wonder in heaven, a woman clothed with the sun, the moon under her feet, and upon her head a crown of 12 stars. Now, if you think about this, uh, who would that be referring to? Who is the woman? Israel. Upon her head a crown of 12 stars, the 12 tribes of the nation of Israel. She being with child, cried, travailing in birth and pain to be delivered. Who is the one that brought the Lord Jesus Christ in unto the earth? Israel. It was through the lineage of Abraham all the way up uh, to the, through the nation of Israel. She is the one. And by the way, Israel is referred to as a woman and she through, all throughout Scripture. So uh, she's about pain to be delivered. And there appeared another wonder in heaven. And behold, a great red dragon, that's Satan, Having seven heads and ten horns, that's the, that's the dragon in his, um, in the form of the Antichrist. We see in Revelation 13, the Antichrist, which is called the beast, has 
um, seven heads and ten horns, seven crowns on his heads. Now, why do, we, why do we see Satan all of a sudden? Now here, the Lord Jesus Christ is about to be born in the earth, on the earth. Satan is right there. He's going to do something about that. This is why we see the red dragon, the way we see Satan. And his tail drew the third part of the stars of heaven, and it cast them down to the earth. Third part of the stars of heaven in reference to the angels. This is where the reference gets the third part of the angels fell. When Satan fell, and there's so much more in the background of this, but we can't cover all that. And the dragon stood before the woman, which was ready to be delivered for she, to devour her child as soon as it was born. She brought forth a man-child who was to rule all nations with a rod of iron. Well, when is this child going to rule the rod, rule all nations with a rod of iron? There's Old Testament uh, um, prophecies that speak of this, that he is going to rule with a rod of iron the Lord Jesus Christ. Her child was caught up into God. When was he caught up into God? The ascension. And to his throne. He's seated at the right hand of the Father right now. And the woman fled into the wilderness, where she hath a place prepared of God. This is in the tribulation period. We see the woman, Israel, uh, will flee into the wilderness for protection, and God will protect. This is talking about the believing, believing remnant of the Jewish people during the tribulation period. They will be protected by, uh, by God. Uh, they should feed her a thousand and two hundred and three three days. Very possible, and during the tribulation period. When they go into the wilderness, once again, God will feed them, possibly manna again, during the tribulation period. There was war in heaven. Michael. Michael is the archangel. He is the war angel. All throughout scripture, he is the angel that, uh, remember back in Daniel, he come to Daniel's uh, uh, defense at, uh, uh, in the book of Daniel there. And uh, so he, he is kind of the war angel. We have Gabriel, too. Gabriel is the messenger. And uh, he is the one that gave the message to Mary that she was going to have a child, and so forth, and other places. Okay, there was war in heaven. Michael and his angels fought against the dragon, which is Satan. And the dragon fought in his angels and prevailed not. Neither was their place found any more in heaven. The great dragon was cast out, the old serpent called the devil and Satan, which deceiveth the whole world. He was cast out into the earth, and his angels were cast out with him. And I heard a loud voice saying in heaven, Now is salvation and strength and the kingdom of our God and the power of his Christ. For the accuser of our brethren, the accuser, remember I said he accuses us, the accuser of our brethren is cast down, cast down to the earth, which accused them before our God day and night. Now, when does this actually take place? It is in the middle of the tribulation period, after the first three and a half years. Don't have time to go through all the scriptures for that, but that's, uh, that's when it takes place. Um, so they overcame him by the blood of the Lamb and by the word of their testimony, and they loved not their lives unto the death. We're going to have to stop right there, but way over time, but maybe next time we'll kind of go on here and uh, give a little more information talking about the abomination of desolation which happens in the tribulation period that's at the middle of the tribulation period also uh, the Lord Jesus Christ speaks of that, Daniel speaks of that Daniel 9 and uh, maybe next time we'll look at that and I hope it just kind of whet your appetite a little bit <laughs> what's going to happen in the future shall we pray gracious heavenly father we thank you for your word and we thank you for the time that we can study your word and to know it, to understand what the future really holds. Thank you for your grace. Thank you for the message of grace which we are living in today that is purely by uh, believing what you, in what you have done for us. Uh, his death, his burial, and resurrection. If we simply believe that, then we know, Heavenly Father, that, that we are saved. And we thank you for that message. And we just pray now that you would continue to be with us, guide and protect us, give us that desire to stay in your word. And uh, with this, we ask it in your precious name. Amen.